Antarctica, the coldest place on earth, the world's freezer. And in this barren landscape, you wouldn't expect to find a developer. Yet despite the odds, they are here. And more than that, thriving in amazing detail. Hey everybody, welcome to The Sim Hanger. My name's David, sorry, I mean Mark. Thanks for joining me. But today, not only are we looking at this scenery package from Aerosoft, but perhaps more significantly, we're taking a trip back in time and taking a look at an aircraft that's soon to be released. It's from developer Flying Fries and it's Howard Hughes' XF-11. And like most of his designs, it's eccentric. It's considerably bigger than you would expect and at the time, well, highly innovative. No, it's not the Twin Otter there. Take a peek into the background. Only three of these aircraft were ever produced. This is the first, the Mark I. And it had one successful takeoff and no successful landings because Howard Hughes himself, well, he crashed it. Designed in the mid 40s as a reconnaissance aircraft, it has no weapons and a whole bunch of cameras. Oh, and those two absolutely massive engines, they're exactly the same engines as used on the Spruce Goose, the H4. Designed to climb to altitudes in excess of 40,000 feet and thanks to its multiple fuel tanks, which are configurable, it has extended range and is no slouch, capable of cruising at over 300 knots. And she's exciting to fly, quick on the climb and slow on the roll. You need to have your wits about you. But if this aircraft can't put a smile on your face, well, check your pulse. Due for release early February on flightsim.to. 383 Uniform Montgomery Clearance, clear to the Palomar Airport, support after departure, flighting 280. When you're ready to take the next step towards realism with tactile feedback, and you're looking for a navigational unit as part of a cockpit build or perhaps standalone, then Flightsim Builder has a range of competitively priced products available. Their products are replicas of the real product. And I can personally attest to their quality and why, because I use them myself. Want more information? Well, check out my videos, links in the notes below. Want to see the full range? Or well, visit Flight Sim Builder Direct. Welcome to the cockpit and its typical layout for aircraft of this era. It has three seating positions, but only two crew. As mentioned, the fuel flow and also the electric system is simulated. And you have the option to keep the cockpit authentic or get a little bit of assistance navigation-wise. We'll have a look at that in a moment. But first of all, let's head to the rear position. And this is where the radio operator would be stationed. And in addition to the radios and pressurization, it also has fully functioning circuit breakers. So you can model failures as well. And the radio operator was also responsible for occupying the third seat when necessary. Crawling on his hands and knees, he would head into the nose of the aircraft so he could take command of the various cameras. Anyway, I can waffle more as we fly, so it's getting a little cold, so let's get the engine started. Parking brake is on. Flaps are up and gear is down. And let's check throttles at idle. It comes with a full checklist, which I'll loosely be following. First port of call, let's get the battery on. We have power. We can remove the animated chocks and also the engine covers. Towards the back of a console you'll see there's a switch there with a yellow light that shows the access bay is open. So we're good to go and we can attach the GPU. And once again this is animated externally. There you'll see the GPU at the base of the ladder. The ladder allowed access into the aircraft. It was certainly function over form. Visibility is quite poor, so we better get some lights on. That's our lights there. Now at this stage, we'll put on our nav lights. And now our fuel selectors for the engines, right and left for the respective engines, as well as tail. Short hop today, so I won't be using or needing the center tank, so I'll leave that off. And now for normal startup, you would open up the cow flaps on these two monster engines. That's the cow flaps there. And you open them using this handle here. I love the sounds. But because the temperature here is below zero, I'm going to leave them closed. I don't want the engines icing up before we start. 
Next step is let's move those massive propellers out of feather so we can push both prop levers forward to the neutral position. We'll start our left engine first, so left mixture fully forward and the prop lever for that engine fully forward as well. And again, because it's cold, I'm just going to crank that throttle just a tad. Left fuel pump on and magnetos to that engine to both. We now need to prime the engine and we're just about done and ready for start. We'll prime the engine by selecting this button here and holding it down for 2 to 4 seconds. And now we're ready for start. Push the starter switch forward. Yes, your eyes didn't deceive you, you've got contra-rotating propellers on each engine. Alternator for left engine on, and just below that is your avionics switch, let's get that on as well. You can now check your PNTs, and then follow exactly the same process to start your right engine. Right engine is started, so alternator on. It's now time to get rid of the GPU, which we can do by the switch here. We can get rid of the ladder here and then close the access door. And we're about ready for taxi. That definitely feels a little warmer. Now time to put our pitot heat on. The switches just above that are the engine anti-ice. I don't need these right now, it should be alright, but below that switch is the heating for the canopy. I'm expecting some icing, so we'll put that on. Over on the right hand side is our pressurization, as well as various options and settings for our recognition lights. We're nearly there now, strobe lights to come on, and also we can put on our taxi lights. Push that one further forward and it's landing lights. And this switch here is our recording light. If we need it to provide light for the cameras. Don't need that right now, don't want to melt that article. We'll switch that one off. We can now set our trim for takeoff and it indicates a small line here. There we are. And that's our trim setting for takeoff. And our flaps can go down one stage to 10 degrees. The other stages of 20 and 30 degrees respectively are for landing. We can put on some of our cockpit and our panel lights. A variety of cockpit lighting is available. And you have functional dimmer switches as well to vary the intensity. That's a bit better. We're now ready to go. There's a clipboard in the cockpit so you can choose various different instrument settings from authentic. I've selected the GNS 530. Controls free and clear, parking brake released, and let's taxi to the runway. The clipboard has other functions, as per many other aircraft, you can set your fuel. It has failures, you can set the likelihood of failures, as well as aircraft status and other functions. Well, let's hope that our first flight today is going to be more successful than that of Howard Hughes. Barometer for departure is set, landing lights are on. And we'll just line up on the runway and do our final checks. We can check our exhaust gas temperatures, fuel levels, pressures and temperatures. Everything looks good to go. As I mentioned earlier, it's just a short hop today. We're on the Australian side of uh, Antarctica, departing from Wilkins Aerodrome. We're going to be heading directly to the coast. Then we'll turn and fly over the helicopter pad and station before landing at the skiway. Our scenery is from Aerosoft, it's available directly from their website, it's relatively inexpensive and it's volume 2 of their Antarctica series covering the Australian bases. The scenery covers the three bases in some considerable detail, it's very well done, plus a number of penguin colonies off the coast. Throttles to 30%, let them spool up, then throttles to max, we're away.
Rotate at 130 miles per hour. She's powerful, pull that nose up. Positive lift gear up. We're already doing nearly 200 miles an hour. Prop back below 25. Don't want to damage the engine. Prop RPM now 24. Coming back on the throttle. Speed around 300 miles an hour. Feeding in some trim to reduce my climb rate. The XF11's climb rate is incredible. Now just passing 8,500 feet and it looks like at last we're breaking out of the cloud and that terrible weather down there. Nice to see some blue skies. This thing's like a rocket. It's like, well, it's a wing with two massive engines strapped to it. It's absolutely crazy, but it's absolutely fun. 10,000 feet climbing 1,500 per minute. When flying this beast, one thing to notice is that although the pitch is extreme, ailerons are relatively small, with opposing spoilers on the other wing, and the roll is relatively slow, and you need to plan that in advance. And be very gentle with some rudder input. She's very sensitive. While we've just passed 10,500 feet, we don't really want to climb anymore. I've just leveled her out. And the XF11 does have a basic autopilot. That's autopilot on, altitude hold, heading hold, you have pitch hold and that's about it. Keep your eye on the instruments and especially the exhaust gas temperature. Pulled my prop back to about 2300 RPM, managing my throttle for about 300 miles an hour. She's capable of more. At the radio operator station, well, just about everything is functioning, including the radios and the tape recorder. At this sort of altitude, make sure that you've got your pressurization on. When using the autopilot at slower speeds, I did note that the nose tend to oscillate. I don't think that's the flight model for the FX11. I think that's more Microsoft Flight Simulator symptom. My mixture's back about a third at this altitude. The developers, Flying Fries, have done a great job with regards to attention to detail. And there's a fair amount you can explore that I haven't covered in this video. You can manually plug in the GPU. The fuel control valves are, well, you need to climb the ladder to see them. You pass them on your way in to the cockpit. The avatars you're seeing are not standard. They don't come with the aircraft. They're from Got Friends and part of their avatars range. As I mentioned before, this is only a short hop, so let's get this autopilot off. This aircraft is relatively easy to hand fly, but time for us to start our descent. Coming back on the throttles, we're just coming over the coast, and I want to get down to about 2,000 feet. She's capable of dropping very fast. I'm planning on a descent of between 1,500 and 2,000 feet per minute. But once again, she's capable of more. The XF11 joins a somewhat exclusive club in Microsoft Flight Simulator. She's fast, she's got quite an extended range, and if you fancy that sort of thing, old school navigation. Perfect for those long hauls. We're not far now from KC Helicopter Station. Let's clear up this weather a little bit so we can see more of the scenery. I think I'll just, I think we'll go for some high clouds. That looks better. And the station is just ahead of us. The station's distance from the coast varies obviously depending on what time of year it is. And the station itself, well it features an amazing amount of detail. And as we fly overhead we'll just take a quick look. The landing strip for aircraft is not too far away, a couple of nautical miles inland. It's the Casey Station Skiway, and that's where we'll be landing today. But this station here, well, obviously helicopters. Looks like there's some fair expansion going on by all the activity. A couple of people there by the pickup, waiting for the next ship perhaps. There's a lot of different things to discover here, including what appears to be, yep, a resident penguin. One of the real pleasures of Microsoft Flight Simulator, of course, is you can visit places like this. 
places you're unlikely ever to see in the real world. Highly recommended as it gets you out of your comfort zone in a number of ways. Of course, in the real world, the XF-11 never ventured into Antarctica. We're now turning towards the skiway, tapped off on the throttle, speeds back into the white zone so we can bring down flaps one notch, 10 degrees, let the speed bleed off to about 160 mile per hour and then gear down. That's the skiway ahead of us, just top left. Now a gentle roll onto final. Landing lights are still on, PNT's looking okay. Speed now 150 miles an hour, flaps 30%. Let's hope we're more successful than how it was. This aircraft does have reverses, but we won't need them long runway. Touchdown on the main gear at about 110 miles an hour. I mentioned earlier in the video that the XF-11 is quite a large beast. There's another twin otter ahead there. I think we'll park up next to that to give you an idea of the difference in size. If you like venturing to new places, then Antarctica from Aerosoft, well, it's going to be about 15 US dollars or 15 euros, and it's something completely different. The XF-11, that'll be released, I'm not quite sure when, I think it's early February, from Flying Fries via the flightsim.to website. Not sure of the price. I've had a lot of fun with it and thank you to Flying Fries for letting me have a preview copy. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you as always for watching. Stay well, look after yourselves. I'll see you all again very soon. And bye for now.